that you're all seeing this in full screen, Glory. And mm -hmm. just checking that you're expecting to see Basics 104, the menu items that we didn't cover in 102. So now is the time to shout out if <laughs> you thought this was going to be something different. Uh, so you've all seen this before, so I'm not going to waste time on it, just to confirm that you will get a copy of the video and the presentation afterwards to go over in slow time, should you wish to. And uh, we are going to be looking at all the menu items that are not in the top row of Parish Online, uh, which includes uh, anything in the second row, any mini menus that pop up from inside the system, and all the menus or items on the bottom row. And then towards the end, we'll go interactive and see if you've remembered anything that I've been saying this afternoon, because it'll be like a quiz. So Ramoon's in deep trouble already. Um, <clears throat> all right, so it will be interactive. And again, you've all done this before, so I hope I don't need to waste your time on this. In the top left corner of your Parish Online screen, uh, these little menu items pop up. So you look at the, the line with Parish Online on it is the top level of menu items, and we've covered that. And today we're going to talk about the second row items, um, which, by the way, are not covered anywhere in the knowledge base. So anything that you hear today is gospel because there's no one around to contradict it. I think it's marvellous. Um, but we've got five icons here. We're going to go through each one of those in slow time, and then we'll move on to the other items. So first one is the home uh, icon, which is pretty self-explanatory. It, it uh, takes you back to basically your starting point. So where you log in or what shows up when you log in the first time into Parish Online, you can jump back there by clicking on home. It's a good way of getting yourself back to reorient, reorient take yourself if you've sort of somehow got lost or you've gone off searching for your grandmother's home in Glasgow. This gets you back to where you want to be. Uh, if you had layers previously selected, then they stay on, but your, um, uh, but the location drops back to your home location. So I think that's very straightforward. Moving on to the second item, which is this, uh, previous view arrow, uh, what that does is take you back to the previous screen, which can be very helpful because it's repeatable. You can go back several screens if you want to. The only issue was that any layer that was turned on for the first previous screen remains turned on and it stays turned on going all the way backwards. And so if you had layers turned on for screens back more than one, they disappear but the one that was on, on the first one stays in place. So again, very straightforward, very simple, um, useful if you suddenly want to go back to where you were a moment or two ago. Next one we're gonna go to is drag zoom. And I got a sort of little sample here where you have to imagine uh, what we're going to look at is the way the system normally performs. So take a look at the screen in front of you. There's a pond on the left-hand side and a pond up at the top. Um, and if you click on your mouse and drag to the left, which is what I'm doing, then the whole system will move. So the big pond at the top is now moved to the left-hand side. The little pond down the bottom has disappeared. And we've got a new pond has popped up here. And then notice that there's this building here next to the large pond because that's going to become the focal point. Now, if I click on drag zoom, it gets underlined to show that it's on. And then if you left click on something, it draws a square around it, a bit like a select in any other um, sort of standard program. Um, and once you release the, uh, the left click, um, the whole thing expands into this. So basically, it's a way of zooming in in a hurry on a specific item. So you can just choose the item, you can drag around it, um, and then it jumps for you uh, to several times the original size. Uh, the drag zoom icon up here automatically turns off each time you do this. So if you want to do it again, you need to turn it on again, uh, because you'll see that the underline has disappeared up here. Um, but it's, it's eminently repeatable. Um, 
I don't know how useful it is. I don't think I I remember using it in, in anger uh, particularly, but it's nice to know that it's there. Next one we're going to go to is the annotate items layer. And before we go into it, I'm just going to show you what's in my system at the moment. So I've got three annotations uh, in the annotate layers uh, <clears throat> system. You remember how you get to this, you normally would click on tools, annotate, and then we've listed all to show all the points that I've got uh, set up for annotation. Um, basically, these are all from uh, the Basics 102 lecture. So this will not come as any great surprise. But if you then um, go to a, a sort of familiar piece of ground, which in my case is our local recreation ground, I uh, then click on annotate layers, it turns on every annotation. And by sheer chance, it's quite extraordinary really, all of my annotations are located here on this recreation ground. So you just get all of your annotations turned on at once, uh, with one single button, which, which can be very useful if you're doing presentations and you set up everything um, to highlight various bits of the presentation that you're making, you can turn them on or off um, as you wish. So that's just a toggle switch, toggle it back off again, and it disappears. And the last icon up here is the magnifying glass. Uh, the next page is a little bit confusing, but what I'm basically saying is if you click on this, then this is what, I'm going to have to go the right way, sorry, this is what appears. And basically what I've said is you click on the magnifying glass, you get a big black screen in which you can type anything you want. And we're just going to suppose, let's take as an example, we want to know about flooding. And we don't know, we can't remember which layers tell us about flooding. So I'm going to type the word flood up here. And you'll notice that instantly three separate collections of layers come up. So each of these layers has got something to do with flooding. I'm going to assume, let's have a look at this one here, the middle one. And it pops up with uh, agricultural land use in this part of Somerset. And it doesn't make very much sense to you as it stands. So I'm just going to tick on view legends to turn the legend on. And now you can see that uh, the various grades of land have got color shading. So most of this land here, and just keep an eye on the shape of it, is grade four, which is sort of arable grass, basically. And if we now move to the, go back to that flood selection screen that we had, and instead of natural England habitats, I'm gonna click on the environment agency, which also has floods all over it, as you can see, and click on zone three. And notice that most of Somerset in this part of uh, the county, at least, disappears under water under certain rain conditions. And the shape of this is remarkably similar to that of the grassland that the farmers are using. Um, and there is a connection that the really the, the one uh, crop that thrives from being underwater for a month or two each year is grass. So um, lots and lots of cows and milk in Somerset because much of the county disappears underwater, which is great for really green grass and really good milk. So that was the first uh, bunch of icons we're looking at in what I call the second row of menu. Um, gone through each of those, we're now gonna do the mini menus that pop up uh, when you click in various layers. So we go to the first one. <clears throat> and just a reminder of what happens when you've got layers turned on. So you remember that this column here shows all the collections of layers and each one of these uh, lines, if you will, has a whole collection of layers underneath. And uh, the ones that have got uh, layers turned on have got a nice circle around so you can know where to go to turn something off that's already on. Um, and if you click on any one of these collections, and I'm gonna choose asset register, if you right click anywhere in the bar, it gets, it brings you up with a, uh, an option to toggle all layers. And what this means is that every layer in that particular collection will get toggled on when you click on toggle all layers. So I've done that and there isn't any particular obvious indication that anything's happened, except that the asset register 
layer of our collection now has a circle around it, which it didn't before. But if we now click on this asset register mini arrow, up pops the layers here, showing you that everyone has been ticked. And lo and behold, on the map, every icon that we have in the asset register has popped up. So very handy to be able to toggle all these layers on or off in one go, should you used to. And it's a toggle, so we do exactly the same thing, right click in the collection level, and the whole lot disappear again. So what I've done now is I've stayed in the parish layers. I've chosen the top one, which is my test point layer, and I've right clicked here. So notice the difference. Up the top is a collection layer. If you right click on that, you get toggle all. Uh, if you right click in a, an actual layer itself, then up pops this mini menu with up to six items available. Now I've chosen to do this one so that you see all six, but it will vary as you choose different layers. So parish layers have got the most of the lot. Um, you never get more than six at the moment until someone makes a change, but that's what we get. But if you're clicking on other third party layers, you may get uh, considerably fewer than six. I've certainly seen four, and there are quite a lot that are just one only. But let's go through what each of these six is and show how they work. And then you just need to remember that um, you can get this mini menu up in any layer, but it won't necessarily have anything like all six items in it. Depends where you are. So just to explain the six items on this slide, the first one is a transparency slider, which will make more sense when we get into it. Um, add feature, you should all be familiar with by now, I'm sure. Um, styling is where you add color, get labels, icons, that sort of thing. Table view, I think all of you have seen before, but this is where you can get to it. Go to extents, probably the first time you've used this with very handy feature, um, if you've selected a particular layer and then you click on this item, it brings up every feature in that layer and puts them on the map. So in other words, it adjusts the map to get in, all of them in. And I'll, you'll see it, it makes more sense. We get down to it later. Ditto with the filter. There's a much more detailed explanation coming up. So when you right click on the mini menu, it takes on the uh, assets, if you will, the attributes of the layer that you clicked in. So here I'm in Graham test point. And when you click now on add, uh, sorry, we're not gonna click on add feature, I beg your pardon, uh, but all the uh, features that come up when you click on any one of these items relates to this particular layer. So the first one was the uh, transparency slider. So I think this is available on every layer. This is the one thing that's common to all layers, as far as I can remember. Um, but I've just chosen to put it on the map there here. And I've set it at 100% so that you can see everything that the map has to offer. There's no obscuring at all. You've got 100% transparency. If I go now and move it the other way down to zero, then bingo, most of the details disappear. All you're left with is the parish boundaries and the parish name. So there's nothing else here. So basically, uh, the transparency is zero. Nothing can come through. Uh, however, this system is really most useful when you're using it in conjunction with other layers. So I'm moving on to the next slide. And I've turned on here, you can see the photography layer, hence the tick mark. And we've got zero transparency for the mapping. So there's no map information. What you're seeing is 100% photography. Uh, but you do still see the parish boundary outlines and the parish boundary names, but no other mapping information is coming through. However, if I now change this zero back up to 100%, we go the opposite way. You've now got 100% map information and zero aerial photography, although you can see the check mark here, it's still turned on, but nothing's visible. So now I'm going to shift this now down to around about 40%. And you'll see you've got a mixture of the two. You're getting some of the map information coming through. You're beginning to see the names of particular areas or farm buildings or villages here. You can see some of the names of the roads popping through, but you still see enough of the photography 
to make sense of the aerial photograph. So basically you're, you're balancing here the slider to get the degree of obscurity or transparency, you think about it how you will, uh, to help you with whatever the task in hand is at the moment. So the obscurity, the transparency slider really works well in conjunction with more than one layer. Uh, but and very useful, I find that if you're doing um, oh, allotment plotting, for instance, plotting out these separate lots in apartments, then having on the mixture of the, uh, the map and the uh, photography is just what you need. All right, <clears throat> so that was the slider for the transparency. Now we're going to go down and click on add feature. And you're all familiar with this. What it does is it starts up the feature editor and gives you a blank record for the layer that you were in when you right clicked on the add feature button. However, the system does say we recognize you may not want to be doing this in this layer. So you do get the chance of choosing any other layer up here if you want to. Uh, and uh, so you, you can, it doesn't matter which layer you're in when you right click, you can then go to any other layer should you need to and the feature editor will adjust according to which layer you select. So under this test point, we just got three little columns, one of which is uh, required, so it's outlined in red, and you're not gonna get any information stored in the system until you've both completed a red column and put something on the map. And then your save button comes alive and you can save it and record it and you're all set. So two features necessary if there is a required column you must fill that in or them if there's more than one and you must put something on the map so that was the uh, add feature <clears throat> if we go down to style now up comes a four column page if you will so there's the column of style options the column of labels the column hit this one changes depending upon what you're doing and the preview one is surprisingly useful. What it does is shows what will happen on the map with each action that you take here. So this is constantly changing. It changes color, it changes shape. It, if you've chosen sort of paths or uh, whatever, it shows up here. Very, very useful. What each of these individual things does is actually can be quite complicated. There's an entire training session on styling. So I'm not gonna take your time up now. But basically, this is where you organize what color things come up in depending upon their status. So, uh, for instance, when we do planning applications, the ones that have not yet been uh, made a decision on are all in purple. If you change the decision to um, refuse, then they all go to red. If you change the uh, status to uh, accepted, then they all go to green. And it's this page which controls that sort of color decision. You can also get a wide variety of labels, sizes, colors, and you can put in the halo effect, which is really nice. And again, you see this up in the preview when you've selected on it, and you can get just what you want to uh, achieve without having to go back to the map. Very useful page, this one. Uh, and of course, um, well, I don't say of course, but there is a big section in the knowledge base on styling. So uh, this part of it is well supported. Next one, table view. Again, again, I don't think there's anything new for you here. Bearing in mind that you're in the test point layer, when you click on table, it will show you all the records in that particular layer. So up comes, I've just got the one. Um, and if you remember from your table view, this is where it's really easy and convenient to make changes, particularly if you've got lots of records and you need to make changes in several of them. This is the way to do it. You can't add new records uh, in the table there because you don't have any geographic information for them, but you can certainly make changes. Just type over the change you want to make and, and, and adjust it. Uh, and then you save it by clicking outside the, the row that you're working on. So it has the ability to export and you'll also see later, um, no, sorry, it was a, pre a previous session. You had the ability to jump to the map showing this particular item that comes up here with an extra box saying go to map. Um, nice, nice table view, I think, is one of the most useful places. So it's really good. And you can always export the data to a spreadsheet. 
Right, going back to our selections, go to extent. Now to demonstrate go to extent, I've changed layers. So I'm now in our planning applications layer and I've turned off my test point. And just take a look at the map for a second, if you will. So up in the top corner, we've got the village of Upton and we've got one, two, three, four planning applications showing. Um, and the bottom one is in the middle of the page. So you've got a long way down here to Little Load Village. Um, if we now click on go to extent, what that's going to do is to show every record in this particular layer. Um, and it'll have to adjust the map accordingly to fit them all in. So I'm going to click on go to extent. And you'll see now that the village of Upton has dropped down just enough to allow this top level record to come in. And we now have five records. And the bottom one, instead of being sort of somewhere in the middle of the page, has now dropped down to accommodate the map to take in this top one. So you're now looking at all the records for our planning applications in 2019 that I actually got around to entering. Um, and we're going to say, let's show you now on the next page how you can use the filter system to narrow this down to the one that you're interested in. So certainly in later years, our planning applications uh, uh, much higher numbers. So it's difficult to see the one you want. Some, in fact, some of them are so close together, it's very difficult to see which is which. So the next step is to go to the filter button and do something about that. So I'm gonna click on filter. And basically what pops up is this um, screen in the top left corner. Now, what I've done is repeat that screen across the page here, just to show you what happens when you fill things in. But the, the basic thing when you click on filter is you get this uh, pop up here on the top left side. So on the next right, we're going to show you what happens when you click on the filter column down arrow. And basically up comes all the columns in that particular layer. And it says, just what do you want to filter on? And in which case, we're going to say, we're going to filter on the application number. So I click on that and this screen will now show you we've selected application number. And then we're going to say, so how do you operate? How do you choose uh, this information to give you what you want? I've gone with contains, but you could use equal starts with ends with as well as all uh, contains. So then having clicked on that, you will then pop up here with your final filter layer showing that you're clicking on the application number and you want to find those which contain HOU, uh, which in, in Somerset's terminology is any planning application specifically related to um, working with a house. Uh, and when you've got all these set up the way you want them, you just click on save. And now we go back to the map and we see that the four out of the five uh, planning applications which did not relate specifically to a house change have gone and you've got just this one showing up which makes it very easy to select and work on and demonstrate to people. Uh, you'll notice that in the layer column you've now got a blue filter symbol showing up showing you that you're not looking at all the records you're looking at only the filtered records. Uh, which is convenient to remember when suddenly you find you've lost something, it may be because you filtered it out. All right, so the summary of where we've got to so far, uh, we looked at the five menu icons in the second row. We've looked at the variations of the layer mini menus using the parish layers because they've got six. And uh, most third party layers will have no more than four and many will only have just the transparency slider. And now we're going to look at what happens if you click uh, on a feature on the map. So I've chosen as uh, my feature this particular farm. So I've just zoomed in and scrolled till I get to this particular farm. Uh, and now I'm going to right click on it. And up pops a little mini menu with three choices. Um, and you'll see that copy and bookmarks both have more mini menus to come. Add feature is exactly the same as the add feature that you get from uh, any of the other add feature mini menus. And it also enables you to select the layer that you want if you don't like the layer that you're in. Um, so I'm not gonna go spend any more time on this. We've done that one, but let's go and see what happens if we hover on the copy arrow and it pops up with another mini menu of three choices. 
um, and I've listed them here on the right. So on coordinate, you get the British natural grid output in terms of eastings and northings for the place that you've clicked on, this farm here, basically. If you choose instead the lat long, then you get the coordinates uh, for lat long. But remembering that in Parish Online, you will use the decimalized lot log. So if you're used to lat longs of hours, minutes, and seconds, sorry, degrees, minutes, and seconds, um, you won't see that. What you'll see is the degrees and then a, a decimal point and the fractions that give you that particularly uh, minutes and seconds for that coordinate. Um, and then if you click on extent, it gives you the northeast, sorry, yes, northeast and southwest coordinates. And I've given you examples down here. So for the farmhouse, you know, right click on coordinate, I get these coordinates, which is an easting and a northing. If I do on the lat long, I get these coordinates. Um, and you'll remember that with the prime meridian going through Greenwich, Positive is east, so anything to the east of Greenwich, around to 180 degrees, is, is positive. And we're west of Greenwich, so we've got a minus sign. So we're, we're minus, uh, we're two degrees and uh, two and three quarter degrees, basically, west of, of Greenwich. And we're at latitude 51 north, which, of course, you all know because you're all roughly around 51 north. Uh, and then these are the two sets of coordinates, easting and northing for the bottom left corner, easting and northing for the top right corner. And then um, in view coordinates, which you will all have remembered from your Basics 102 lecture, you can feed in coordinates um, and it's useful to sort of feed these coordinates back in and see if it brings you back to the farm. Um, and for those of you who are paying attention, you may want to remember this. All right. So what we did then was the copy one. If we go back to this mini menu and instead hover over bookmarks, uh, this is what comes up. Most of you who've ever added bookmarks or used them will recognize this. This is exactly the same menu that you get up from the top level menu called view uh, bookmarks. And uh, you can do exactly the same thing here. So you can add a new one or you can look at any of your old ones. And just as a reminder for bookmarks, what they do is they store not only the location that you're interested in, but the layers you had in uh, effect when you stored that location. So it's a way of jumping to the correct scale, to the correct location, and the correct layers all in one smooth mouth click. Really, really useful. Um, I strongly recommend the use of, of bookmarks and will give you my warning yet again. Remember that bookmarks are very personal. They're stored against the login name of the person that's using the account. So if you want to share your bookmarks with anybody else, they can't see them unless you create them on an account that they also use. So here in Long Sutton, I create an account, which you will see later, by the way, called parish council and every parish councillor can then log in and they see all of the bookmarks that I've saved and I can see any bookmarks that they've added. Uh, so that's just a uh, suggestion that you might find useful. If you like bookmarks yourself and you want to share them with people, you have to be in the same account that they're going to use or they have to be in the same account that you're using, whichever way you look at it. All right, so we've done the second level of menus, we've done the uh, layers um, pop up mini menus. We've done the mini menus that pop up when you click on a, an item, a building or a feature. And now we're gonna look at the bottom menu items. So imagining that you're looking at your full screen, here's the layer of uh, the column of layers here on the left-hand side. And then down right at the bottom, you've got these three vertical dots um, which is leads to another menu. We've just talked about the login account. Who do you log in as? And you can see I have indeed logged in as the parish council. Uh, then we've got um, location in uh, B British National Grid coordinates, which is what Geosphere defaults to using. And I've, I've got scale here, which we're going to talk about. We're going to talk about toggle mask, what that does, and these two over here, the service status indicator and the recent updates indicator. So let's go through each one of these in turn. So 
Those three dots, if you click on them down here in the bottom line, will bring up this little menu of two choices. And the geolocation choice just allows you to toggle geolocation on or off. And if it's on, you'll have a little tick mark here. And if it's off, you won't. Uh, and this is really not much use to you at all on your uh, desktop computer, uh, but maybe much more use to you with your smartphone. Now, if those of you may not have appreciated yet, you can bring up Parish Online in your browser on your smartphone. And all this system is saying, may we use your GPS on the smartphone to track you and the map in Parish Online will move with you. So it's fabulous if you're going out to register your assets and you think that life is easier if you've got a photograph of the asset, whether it be a park bench or a street light or a grit bin or whatever. Um, if the feature is already in Parish Online, then when you get there to the right place with your smartphone and you've got the geolocation on, uh, the Parish Online on your smartphone will be wherever you happen to be. And if you take a photograph, you can add it directly to the park bench in which you're standing in front of. Um, so really a great way of adding um, photographs to your uh, asset register. So this really applies um, to your smartphone, but of course you can do it on your desktop. It isn't gonna move very far, hopefully, because your desktop isn't moving very far. The other choice is removing overlays. <clears throat> and this is very straightforward. It just turns off all the layers that you may have turned on, but only applies to the beige collections, the brown ones. So the green ones up the top, ignore this command. So anything you've got turned on in green, stays turned on. Uh, the remove overlays refers to everything in the brown or beige layers. Next item is the scale. Well, I've done it twice just to show you the differences because these are both representative of 500 meters, but obviously very different lengths depending on which scale the screen that you're looking at is in. So um, the distance that it represents may stay the same, but the distance that it takes to measure it is quite different, uh, which I think you'd expect, but it's just a very handy aid to have. It's always in the bottom left corner of your screen, so you can uh, measure by eye how far it is from one place to another um, quite approximately. Um, useful, I've actually used that quite a lot, so I think that you, you know people who are doing um, parish online for measurements and seeing how far things are. You can obviously use tools measure, but you can also do it a quick by eye one, looking at the scale down the bottom left corner. So this next one is what I call the first of two multi-use areas on the bottom line. And what I mean by multi-use is that the contents here change depending on what you happen to be doing. So. This one normally shows the person that you're logged in as, but if you've got something sitting up in the uh, search button up here, the top right in address space, then it enables you to clear it. You'll get a sign that says clear search text. You click on here and it just empties the search box for you. Um, if you don't have that address space filled, or if you do have it filled, but it's with a postcode number, then it ignores the postcodes. It doesn't work except for text uh, with people's addresses. Um, once you've cleared the search text, then this is a toggle, so this clears back to, when it goes back to showing your uh, account role again, until you put something else into the address space uh, search box. So multi-use area number one, Multi-use area number two is the one next door to it, uh, which basically is a toggle. And every time you click on this icon, it changes shape. So if it's got a dot in the front of it, it means that this address here is the address of the pointer, the dot that you created by entering an address space or postcode search. And when it finds the answer, it'll put a dot on the map for you. This is the location of that dot. If you toggle on this icon, uh, it'll switch to no dot. And then that's giving you the four corners of your current screen, or rather the four coordinates for the bottom left corner and the top right corner. 
So I've actually yet to find out when I need to know that information, but obviously somebody has at some point, otherwise it wouldn't be there. And finally, if you click on this toggle one more time, it changes shape completely to this sort of upside down tear shape, if you will. Uh, and this moves wherever the mouse moves. So it's tracking the location of the mouse, which means that these numbers are going crazy because as you scroll around, they're all tracking you. Um, again, quite useful if you're just saying, so where the heck are the coordinates for this place? Um, and you stop there, but you're gonna have to tediously write down the numbers by hand, because if you move the mouse to copy it or anything, then the, all the numbers change. Um, if you've got one of those screen grabs or screenshots that you can take, which doesn't involve using the mouse, i.e. you can turn it on with your keyboard, then that's really useful. Uh, and, and that's the way I do it. Okay, so that was multi-use area number two. Uh, we're now going on to the toggle map mask. Uh, not only will we do what does this do, but we'll also show what the impact is. So the next four screens will be examples of what we're doing, but this screen is showing you what you can do. So there's, there's actually two controls here. The left hand one is a straight toggle on off uh, and you move it. So you slide it to the right to go on and it'll go green, slide it to the left, it'll go off and go white. The one to the right is a straightforward toggle but the icon never changes, all right? It just, if you toggle it once, it'll be light mask. If you toggle it twice, it'll be a dark mask. If you toggle it the third time, it's a white mask. Um, and then you've got the option of being off. Um, but if you had this one switched off, it doesn't matter what you do clicking on here because the whole thing's off. All right, so what this does is for areas outside your parish, um, basically any parish around yours, um, you can uh, make, there's no difference at all if there's no masking on. If you put on a light mask, that means that your area is highlighted a bit or alternatively the outside area is faded a bit, depending on how you look at it. Um, you can do a dark one and you can do a white one and we're gonna show you examples of each. So here is the parish boundary, our home set up with all the boundaries set on and the mask is off, it's white down here. So there is no obvious difference between the parishes, who cares? Uh, so basically you're not trying to make any distinction between your parish and the, the ones next door. However, for the next one, we've actually turned on the toggle and then we've clicked this icon once and we've got the light mask. And basically you can see we slightly degraded what you can see in the surrounding area. Um, but everything in your area stays um, as it was before. So um, light mask, not always obvious. It becomes much more obvious when you're printing stuff out. And uh, people will find that if you're printing something that covers a parish boundary and you've got a mark, a map mask on, the difference becomes quite definite between your area and the one next door. If you choose to toggle this one again, then now you've got a dark mask and, and the, the effect of this is obvious. So basically everything uh, outside you goes gray, everything inside your parish stays as it was. Click on the toggle one more time. And this has gone to a white mask where you've wiped out everything outside your borders. So again, very convenient if you're looking to print something and you want to just print your parish and everything inside it, but ignore who's outside then this is the one for you. The white mask is great. Uh, and that was masking. The next one on the icon is this little uh, lightning flash icon here. If you click on it, it brings up this service status pop up. Um, and if the lightning flash is green, it means that all four services are up and running, which to be fair to Parish Online is 99.9% .9 of the time. Uh, for those of you who were around, there was an outage the other day of about 10 minutes and lo and behold, the lightning flash went red. And when you clicked on it, every one of these services was red. And then even as you watched, the top two and the bottom one came back on and print service stayed in red. And it just shows that when the system is rebooting 
Um, the print service is the last to recover. Each of these recovers pretty quickly and more or less simultaneously. Um, but you can certainly see which service is in trouble if there is uh, an option. As, as I said, it is very rare. Uh, Geosphere or rather Parish Online is stored on Amazon Web service Services. So Amazon Web Services servers, uh, and they tend to be pretty reliable. So that was that one. Last one is the updates uh, button. It's clear when nothing has changed, but you can still see these updates when you click on it. So you click on it and up pops the latest updates. And these are not necessarily um, very fast changing. So here you'll notice the latest one is the 22nd of March, which is not that long ago, but the one before it was August last year. So, you know, four, four or five months um, between updates. Uh, the icon changes color when there's a new update. But for the life of me, I can't remember if it changes to red or gold or, or something else. I think it's gold, but it might be red. Anyway, you'll see it um, when you notice it. If it isn't clear like this or black, uh, depending on your viewpoint, then there are no new um, updates. But it's worth going through these just to make sure you're familiar with them. This is a scroll bar, so you, there's quite a lot more uh, down here if you scroll down just to bring yourself up to date if there are things that you've forgotten that are in place at the moment. Uh, incidentally, for anybody who noticed that the, when you clicked on the asset register export, you got 264 uh, defibrillators showing up in your report, which was a bit disturbing, but they've now fixed that. So you come back down to the one or two or three, or whatever many you've really got. So that's been fixed. <clears throat> So summary so far, we've covered all of the menus, we've covered the mini menus, and we've covered what happens uh, on the bottom row. And um, I'm just a reminder that the uh, knowledge base, the help and support services in Geosphere is pretty good. Two ways of getting to it. You can click on the cogwheel, top right hand corner, and select help and support. Or once you get there, you can um, bookmark the uh, URL and go straight there in the future. You don't need to be inside Parish Online to get to the knowledge base, which actually is occasionally very useful. There's no point in waiting for it to log in when all you need to do is ask a specific question. So now I'm going to switch to interactive for those of you who are willing to play. Um, and this is a, a test of your memories. OK, so what I'm asking you to do is to, without using any of the top row or left column menus, could you please add a feature to any layer of your choice, add a bookmark for the feature, and then copy the coordinates of that feature. Then if we are doing well for time, which I suspect we will be, then we can try putting those coordinates back into view coordinates, which yes, is a first row item, but it's, it's fun and see if you end up back at the point that you, the building you started from or the feature that you started from. Now, uh, one of the reasons I'm doing this is because it's very easy to get the coordinates mixed up when you go into view coordinates. So if you know that you clicked on a farm building three miles from you and you end up somewhere in the deep South Atlantic when you go into the coordinates, <laughs> you know that you've chosen the wrong format or you've forgotten to put in the minus sign or whatever it happens to be. So I'm going to let you um, get on with this. I'm going to watch you to make sure that you're all not just sitting there twiddling your thumbs and drinking coffee, because that's what I'll be doing. Um, and you're very welcome to go ahead and try my puzzle test. Um, if you don't remember what, uh, how to do this, then um, I don't know what you're going to have to do as punishment. It has to be something revolting, won't it? I know you can give up an Easter egg. Yeah, that's a great idea. <laughs> I mean, you have the look of somebody who did get your work done, your urgent thing. Successful? Yeah, I've done it all. Yeah, but now I'm a bit unsure about the task. Of course you are, <laughs> yes. So if you need a clue, 
The way to start this is to find a feature anywhere in any of your layers and right click on it. And then away you go. If I can just interrupt you a second, I did miss out one important feature. When you're doing the copying of coordinates, it copies the coordinates to your clipboard for you. So everything is already in your system. Um, and if you want to see them, you just do a control V or a paste or into a blank space somewhere and the, the coordinates will pop up. So I forgot to mention that. It is on the slide, but I didn't speak to it when we went through it. Right, with the copying of the coordinates, uh, when I copy it or paste it into coordinate finder latitude longitude, it says um, invalid coordinate. Yes, so um, it's copied two coordinates in one paste. So what you have to do is separate them at the comma. And the first one is your easting. The second one is your northing. And if you if it's the lat long that you did, then there's a, a minus sign. Well, where are you? You're in Chichester. Yes, you're, there should be a minus sign in there somewhere on the easting. Uh, and also at the top of the page, you have a choice of a down arrow of selecting BNG, lat long, or WSG84 or something. And you yeah. need to be on the lat long one if what you copied was the lat long feature. Does that make sense? Uh, yep, that's fine. And have you found yourself? <laughs> are you back where you started? <laughs> or are you indeed in the middle of the North Sea? First time I did it, I have no idea where I was. I was just in the middle of a great big white sea. Yeah, yep, that's that's yeah. the sea somewhere. You, usually it's somewhere close to the Isles of Scilly for some reason. I don't know whether there's a message there. That's it. Got it this time. Yeah, okay. It's come back well come to the right place. Okay, so... Ramon, you're smiling as if you haven't got the slightest idea what we're doing. <laughs> or are you all right? And yeah, I, I am a bit lost, but I'm 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 just okay. playing around uh, looking for I found my layer test one. Oh good, right? And, and you had the feature okay? Uh yeah, no. kind <laughs> of <laughs> okay. So there are a few layers there anyway, so I'm just wondering when and when did they do that? Ah, yes. Well, are you the only person using Parish Online? Yeah. Uh -huh. uh, well, yeah, under this login, <laughs> yeah. Well, one of the beauties of the system is that it's it's very private. So nobody from another parish can come in and see what you're doing and no work that they do will appear on your system. So I can create all sorts of things in your parish, but you'll never see them because they don't pop up on your screen. Um, and likewise, you can't see anything I've done. 
or rather I can't see anything that you do either in your parish or outside the parish. So all the features of parish online, except public map, work all over the country, but the only person that can see them outside your parish is Mr. Nobody. Um, I know him well. <laughs> right. He's a next door neighbor, is he? <laughs> Jane, are you doing well? Your camera is carefully positioned, so I'm unable to see how you're doing. <laughs> so with a question regarding bookmarks, what yep. uh, would we put in there? Because I, I created in my test layer, I created a notice board. Right. Uh, bookmarks is asking for a name. I just put content. But what would you ordinarily put in a, a bookmark? I know previously you showed well, the example of a. Well, I tend to be using them for because it's the most contentious item that we use Parish Online for our planning called uh, applications. So yeah. each planning application that we get, I put in as a bookmark so that anyone can just go and find it and use it and, and bring up all the details for that planning application. But if I can, let me just go to uh, my screen and show you in my system, start Parish Online. So bear with me as I operate at the speed of BT OpenReach. So in my parish layers, if I, um, let me just turn on bookmarks. So you, most of these you'll recognize as planning applications, but there's one down here called the Village Hall Operations Manual, um, which jumps us straight to the Village Hall. And you see that I've added a bullet point for everything that people need to know about the Village Hall. So the first thing that everyone says is, what's the Wi-Fi password? So they click on there. And I'll pop the Wi-Fi passwords for our village hall. Um, but how does the stage lighting work? How do you get the sound system to operate? All the stuff that people need to know about your village hall, I've put in what I gladly or glibly call the village hall operations manual. And, and I put in a bookmark for it. So that's how we got there. I was just clicking on the village hall operations manual. So I would call yours notice board or, or something like that so that you can just call up the notice board anytime you want. I think it's a good idea. Uh, I like that. So how would I actually add something? Because I've, I've put contents. I mean, this was just a test thing. So the contents of the, the notice board. But how would I actually add a list of those contents or a, a copy ah, of the that, image? That's, or... that's more tricky. Um, yeah. What you can do is uh, you can do what I've done here. And you add a bullet point to each item that's in there. And then you can either put a bookmark on each bullet point or um, simply bookmark this page and then people can see for themselves what the contents are. So if you've got notice one is the church is going to be shut for three weeks for repairs or something and notice two is that the, um, the road outside will be dug up for a new power line or whatever and so it goes or um, the next parish meeting will be on such and such a date and you can have a dot for each one of those announcements here in your notice board whatever you're drawn your notice board as uh, and that's how people can see them um, the you could do each one as a layer and then people can just search through the layers but i think that's a, a bit um over you know that's building a mountain to catch a molehill or something uh, but th that's what i would suggest I, I do like the idea of notice board. i think it's a great idea uh, is is it possible if I could share what I've done? Is yes, that of course. Wrong? One second, let me just stop right. sharing. Oh, <laughs> you, I need to be there. That's right. Uh, All yours, Ramon. Go, go for it. Okay, okay. Thank you. Share screen. So um, it's this bit okay. I created, and yeah. I can easily then go and bookmark. So I, I bookmarked it as a triangular. Perfect. Okay. Yeah. So the thing to do is, is uh, come out of there altogether, shut down your layer to the left, uh -huh. okay. and change change the scale. Go to somewhere completely different. So zoom out or zoom in, doesn't matter which. I'd zoom oh. out. Just zoom out a long way on the minor. There you go. Now, now go, oops. 
No, go, zoom away. I want you to get away from there. Oh, <laughs> go out. So yes. those are the change layer. Yeah. No, well, you can change layer if you want to. Yes, that works. Turn off the Ramoon test. Absolutely. Well done. That's good. So now go out to view bookmarks. Yeah. And you'll find the one that says oh. triangular and it'll jump on it. There it is. <gasps> Perfect. Okay. okay. Thank you. That's a pleasure. No, I'm delighted that it, um, to, to see it working. Lovely. That's good. Thank you. <laughs> now I'll try to stop sharing. Right. Yeah. So you. I think. Um, as far as my presentation is concerned, I think I've reached the last item. Let me just check. I think the next item is... Yeah, the Q&A session. So let me come back to showing this. Uh, what we uh, basically need to ask people if they have any questions. Uh, whether you're all happy, was it useful, was it, um, I always ask if people have got ideas of other things they'd like to see as a training session, just so that you can keep me engaged. Um, I'm still a little bit puzzled by the bookmark thing, sorry to go uh, okay. back to that. So, I'd say if I wanted to... Why don't you share your screen, Peter? Okay. So that we can see that what it is that you've done. Right. Can you see that now? Yep. Yep. All right. So, did you you done a, bar, a bookmark? If you do view bookmarks, what have you got in there? Um, I've got nothing in here now because I cancelled the other one. But if oh, okay. I, so if I go back to that uh, bookmark, or can you get yes, or or your or notice that board? Notice board. Yeah. Where's your notice board? You need to turn on a layer for it. Okay, so there's my notice board. All right, so if you now bookmark that and call it notice board. Okay. Okay, so same as we did with Ramoon, if you now disappear somewhere completely different, turn off that layer and, and zoom out to sort of north of Scotland or something. Just zoom way out. There you go. Perfect. Now go up to view bookmarks and turn on your notice board and it jumps straight there for you. So yeah. it's just saved you all the trouble of having to turn on the right layer and go to the right point of your map. So if you want your notice board to be useful to people, <laughs> um, I would suggest you sort of create um, a, a polygon of some sort, maybe you ought to just be the, a shape, a bit like I did, but I, choose the, I chose the village hall just because it's useful. Where do you put your notice boards? We've got a notice board on our village hall. So I would, you might want to put just um, on your notice board layer, if you have a notice or you create a notice board layer, then just outline the guild hall. Um, and then you can start putting, adding points to it like you've already done, but each point is a separate notice. And right. then people will okay. see it whenever they click on that page uh, or this, the guild hall, the up will pop all those um, current notices. Gotcha. Now, I think it's a great idea, actually. I've not heard of it anywhere before. So you've introduced a whole new thing, Peter. Great stuff. Yeah. Well, don't get carried <laughs> away and think I'm intelligent. It was purely by <laughs> No, you've got an A0 potter in the background. You must be very bright. <laughs> <laughs> Jane, you're now obliged to say something. <laughs> sorry. <coughs> it might be difficult because I am losing my voice. Oh, dear. I'm so sorry. I'm what a shame for yeah. Easter. That's really great. <laughs> Bad luck. Well, I am sorry. In that case, let me take it back and say um, this is the Q&A session or this is the end of the show, depending on what you'd like to do. <laughs> if anyone has any questions on anything in Parish Online, I'm happy to talk about them. But if you're all set and want to go, by all means, yeah. please do. Yeah. Oh, so we're now watching Peter work flat out. But well, you're still on screen, Peter, by the way. Oh, am I? Right, I'll take myself off. <laughs> How do I stop sharing screen? Uh, you, you need to be at the top. Yeah. All right, yeah, here we go. Stop share. Here we go. Yeah.
Good job. Right. I was looking at something dodgy, weren't it? <laughs> All right. Um, well, ladies and gentlemen, thank you so much for joining me this afternoon. I hope you all have a wonderful Easter. Eat lots of chocolate, get lots of um, calories inside you, and uh, come back bounding for next week. And uh, thank you very much for your time. If no one else has anything else, I'll say goodbye. Thank you very much, Graham. Thank you, you, thank you, you Helen. See you, Jane. Nice to see you, Ramon. Bye-bye. Good weekend. Bye-bye, Jane.